I'm excited today to have with me a friend of mine and colleague, uh, Dr. Janine Brown, uh, who is one of my favorite New Testament scholars. She does a great job um, as a teacher. A lot of her books are not just good scholarship, but they intend to kind of inform and teach students about important long-term conversations in biblical studies, in hermeneutics. Uh, in biblical theology. I just want to mention uh, quickly, and we'll be talking about these, but two recent books uh, among among Dr. Brown's many books. Uh, one is Scripture as Communication, which is uh, a second edition. So we'll be asking her a little bit about uh, how this version is updated and what, what's been added to it, but we'll have a nice conversation about hermeneutics in general, one of the topics that I sometimes have a hard time with because it's kind of philosophical, but I'm, I'm, I'm eager to learn from her uh, insights. And then uh, another book that's come out recently, her commentary on Philippians in the Tyndale series that has kind of been rebooted, uh, and they're a little bit longer, I think, nowadays, but she... Mm -hmm. um, uh, Dr. Brown is, is you know, I, I, I think it's fair to say known as a gospel scholar, and so she's uh, uh, venturing into uh, Pauline territory. Uh, I think she did a great job. I really enjoyed reading this book, and I'm actually going to use it with my students um, as well as a textbook because it's, it's concise, but it hits uh, so many areas. Um, I think this is great for churches. Uh, it's great for um, students of various kinds. So uh, you can look at uh, her other work. I believe you're one of the editors of the Dictionary of Jesus and the Gospels, second edition. Um, I know that's a, a massive project, took several years, a lot of reading, a lot of editing. Uh, and, and so you're a behind the scenes um, shaper of, of uh, New Testament scholarship, which is pretty exciting. So welcome. Uh, to this interview, and I just want to give you a few minutes just to introduce yourself, who you are, where you teach, and, and what you do and why. Absolutely. Glad to be here with you. And I have to say, I stepped into Pauline Scholarship with fear and trembling to cite Paul in Philippians 2, 12 and 13. Um, so I teach at Bethel Seminary in St. Paul, Minnesota. I've been teaching there for over 20 years. And in fact, if we count part-time work that led up to that probably almost getting close to 30, which is kind of amazing. Um, but I've been really grateful to be in one place the whole time and be a part of that um, growth and continuity and shifting landscape of one institution. Uh, and the support they've given me has been really a blessing to my work. Uh, I am married to Tim. We've been married for over 30 years. We have two daughters, Kate and Libby. And um, they now have their families. They're both married. And uh, Kate and Mark have two little kids. So we have a grandson and a granddaughter, both under three years old. So that keeps me busy. Sometimes I say that was my fall writing work was actually just being with Daisy, uh, staying with Daisy a lot. And I could have written a book or been with my granddaughter. And I'm happy to have had the latter experience. So. Um, well, that's that's great to have you focused on your family, but we are so thankful for your scholarship as well. Oh, and I keep it going on that because that's that's always fun. So always a new project out there. Well, we'll we'll be hopefully getting a chance to talk a little bit about that at the end. But I just want to start off by um, talking a little bit about this book, Scriptures Communication. So, um, you know, I'm going to play devil's advocate here because okay. sometimes. Um, students don't really understand the need for um, education and hermeneutics. So, mm -hmm. you know, let's say you bump into somebody at church and, and you talk about hermeneutics and they say, you know, to read the Bible, all I need to do is open up uh, a study Bible with some historical notes and uh, maybe understand a little bit about genre and, and, and then off you go. So can you talk a little bit about what is hermeneutics? And why is it important to be thinking about this as you're studying the Bible? Absolutely. Um, I introduced two key terms in the book, exegesis and hermeneutics. And um, hermeneutics is sort of the bigger task of interpretation, interpreting the Bible. Exegesis is really trying to read carefully uh, to understand the author's messages, meaning in that original context kind of we have to transport ourselves back for that task, I tell students. Um, and hermeneutics is really the whole of what we're doing as we come to scripture, as we um, read it for whatever we're reading it for. Not everyone comes to, to, to scripture to read it for that original context and trying to understand the history. So somebody who says, 
if I have a study Bible to read a little history and I learn a little bit about genre, that's already an uh, important set of choices that you're making. Um, so what, what drives what we're looking for when we come to scripture, that whole question of what we think scripture is, how we approach it, what we bring to it, what other people bring to it, do we read in community? Or individually, I always argue that we always read in community. We just may not know the community we're reading with or that has influenced us. Um, that whole set of questions of how we read the Bible and for what and how we bring it into a contemporary setting. I it feel, you know, that may seem just like an easy little set of tasks, one part, two part, three part, however you view it. But that whole question of what is that is hermeneutics. Biblical hermeneutics is a look at the whole. So I always illustrate and of course here I do have a bible here right here I'm just going to illustrate it visually so when I'm reading the bible I'm doing a, a reading of some kind and I, I get my students to do an exegetical kind of reading but hermeneutics is what's going on all the way around that you know who's influencing me who are my people I bring what do I think the text is going to do how do I live it out do I live it out do I want to live it out what kind of questions do I ask in order for that to happen just the whole spectrum of questions ideas wonderings philosophical underpinnings that I bring to the ta task I talk about um some literary theories that help me understand scripture as communication, as a, a communicative event. Um, but I also tell students, you all bring a literary theory with you. You just may not have thought through what it is or thought about how does it really impact what I do. Sometimes the literary theory we've been taught as we come to scripture is to take little pieces from all over the place and bring them together. It's kind of a um, integrating a line here, a line there, a line there. Uh, that's a theory that, I mean, it may not have a lot of theoretical basis, but it is a practice that has some rationale behind it, which is this is God's word. So all parts are applicable and all parts can be mixed and matched. There's some sort of theoretical perspective there that I, I want to interrogate in my classes, but um, it doesn't, nobody comes theoryless. Nobody right. comes without an embedded way of thinking about how we do this thing. I want students in this class, not necessarily to come out looking exactly like Janine Brown, but to interrogate their own theories, their own theoretical landscape and practices, and to do that in the community, in the class, and to think about how we're shaped um, and how we might continue to read better with um, good reading values. That's okay. that's really helpful because it, it helps us to see the kind of blind spot that something has formed us in the way we read scripture, which is different than, uh, you know, a, a woman in Nigeria. It's different than, mm -hmm. um, you know, s someone living 200 years ago. Yes. Um, you know, our we kind of just assume certain things when we come to the Bible mm -hmm. in terms of what's a good reading and how to read well. And you're kind of shining a light on that and saying, um, you know, we, we come to it with certain practices, certain influences, and it's important to be aware mm -hmm. of that. Uh, you um, you offer a communication model to those big hermeneutics questions. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about what's distinctive about your approach uh, compared to some other major approaches? I mean, um, to those who, who are not familiar with hermeneutical discussions over the last 300 mm -hmm. years, um, you know, talk a little bit about your specific approach and how it's different than maybe some other approaches out there. Yeah, um, I don't have a unique sort of model. Um, it's drawing from a really good thinking, I would say, from a, a number of different people and also just movements. Um, but I do think highlighting communication can be very helpful um, because of some of the ways the text has been read. Um, I think I would say I grew up in a context and I grew up in a strong church context, um, you know, Christian context, um, but they had more of a code kind of way of thinking about the Bible that, um, that it, you know, you just have to unlock its meaning um, and it's a little more um, uh, like the various parts, we we add them together. So we study various small parts and we add them together and, and it computes out some sort of meaning in the end. Uh, I don't recall hearing as much about, um, so uh, for example, we often heard the gospel text preached each Sunday, uh, one of the gospels, you know, it was a liturgical context and uh, we heard a gospel text preached, but I don't recall hearing much about Luke 
and what Luke was up to, or Mark and what, what Mark was up to. And if I heard anything about Matthew, it was a Matthew as a character in the story, not Matthew, the gospel writer. So that, that idea of an author communicating with an audience was very much in the background, if at all present, kind of explicitly. Uh, and so communication models says, let's put that at the foreground. Um, not that it's always easy to think about what was Paul communicating to the Philippians, but that that becomes a focused goal. Um, so communication um, theories that I bring in, things like speech act theory that says that words not only say things, but they do things. Mm -hmm. um, words on mission, as someone has said, I call it. Um, and then relevance theory, which says we we often assume a lot in our communication, especially with those we know closely um, and who know us well. So um, the con context of relationship and of culture um, means we can fire out really quick little communications that people understand surprisingly, even though they're very brief because there's a lot of known context and knowledge. So when Paul says in you know, 1 Corinthians 8, 1, or 7, 1, uh, and about now about those things I wrote to you, or those now about, yeah, however it's phrased in whatever translation, uh, wow, he's going to start to assume some things. Um, they know what he's written. We don't, we have to sort of reconstruct that a bit, but they don't have to at all. They're like, yeah, we got it right here or whatever. Um, so this sense of communication in a context um, has become a really helpful lens for thinking about interpretation. That's great. Um, and that, that that's so important because it's easy just to turn the Bible into saying anything you want it to say if we completely detach it uh, from, mm -hmm. from its original context, from its original uh, composers. Um, historically, Christians believe that the Bible is both a message created by real people, mm -hmm. flesh and blood people, and at the same time, divine communication. Mm -hmm. um, we use terms like inspiration, um, and we talk about divine authority. Uh, using your model or perhaps in your textbook, how do you put those things together yeah. where you have a human author who is like Paul, where he says, I don't remember exactly who I baptized. You know, he's flawed, mm -hmm. he's limited. And at the same time, Christians recognize this as divine revelation, divine speech. Um, when you put uh, interpretation at an extreme on one mm -hmm. end or the other, purely human communication, or purely divine communication, you lose something, right? So yeah, how do you conceive of this blending or marrying of the two? Um, yeah, so divine discourse, human discourse, and how those both can be happening or both happened at the same time. And how do we discern that? And people parse this out differently, right? Can Paul be speaking when God isn't speaking? Can God be speaking when Paul isn't speaking? Um, in my last two chapters, and I was originally going to have one chapter, but it turned into two, I talk about recontextualization, and that's where, where I really start talking about uh, that phenomenon. And and I, I see it, um, uh, to say it carefully, sort of an, as an analogy with the incarnation, only an analogy, something of an analogy with, with Jesus, who is uh, human and divine, as the church has affirmed in Chalcedon. Um, so, both of those need to be in our thinking about the text as we come to the text. We need to kind of navigate both categories. I, I think I encourage my students to very much listen first for the human author in because they've been they've tended to not even put the human author on the map. Now, if I were working with other students who's in their traditions have come with a different lens, I might ask a different set of questions. Um, but in those final two chapters, I talk about how um, we listen for the divine voice by listening for the human voice. Um, but we also bring our own sort of theological questions to the table. Um, and in community, we discern God's voice um, because as speech act theory has taught us, I'm a loc locution spoke words spoken in the same way that's called a locution locution spoken in one context and is spoken in another context the same locution can have very different it can land very differently it can mean something different i give an example in the book of um put a lid on it 
So that's great. If I'm in the kitchen and I'm working on my husband and I are working after dinner to save some food. And I say, could you put a lid on that? Could you put a lid on it <laughs> with a really nice tone of voice? It means something different than put a lid on it, you know, in another context. So um, that locution itself sort of needs a context that utterance is a, a sort of a locution with a context. And given that we want to um, bring scripture and understand scripture from the ancient context into the contemporary context to hear God's voice, to ask that question of divine discourse, we have to think about these really comp complex things like recontextualizing and how do words land and what's the purpose that was expressed here that we want to hear replicated here as much as possible in order for God's, not just God's voice, but God's, the wisdom of God to be enacted in our own contexts. That's no easy thing. Um, hence two chapters in a book, probably not adequate, but um, to really start thinking about that, how do we bring the text into today? Reading out loud, um, I, I was um, in a couple of different contexts this last weekend where we had a lot of scripture reading out loud. And it struck me that um, that's a really powerful practice. And I also, in my mind, am hearing how, do, how does that land in our own context? Um, uh, especially as I'm hearing Psalms that were for Israel now spoken in a context um, where I, you know, what's my relationship to Israel? How does that work in the application process? I don't know if that was too diffuse, but that's kind of a <laughs> no, start helpful. on those complex issues. Um, sometimes I hear the phrase, um, the Bible is written for us, but it wasn't written to us. Mm -hmm. uh, is that is that something that you feel like fits into your model or do would you adjust that at all? I think that's a really helpful way to frame it. I talk about that in class. I'm, I don't think I've used that in the book, but it is that sense of um, how are we that audience? I think we have a, a sense where we need to recognize um, not that we're secondary in the audience, but that we are, um, there's a grafting in to those original audiences to use a Pauline image uh, so that it is written to particular audiences, first Corinthians. So to the Corinthian church in that first century context, um, but it remains for us. It, it, there, God has something for us. And even in Corinthians in chapter 10, Paul can say, these things are written for you. The, what was written to Israel, they were written for the Corinthians upon whom the end of the ages has arrived. Mm -hmm. It's a powerful statement and also kind of a mind bending one to say, okay, it, it was written to Israel and it was also written for the Corinthians. So there's some internal support for that kind of idea. Um, and I think it's a helpful way to say, I am still part of that stream of the people of God in continuity with Israel first and then the early church and uh, I, Joel Green emphasizes that so well, I think, that we still are in that stream. Um, but we have to think very thoughtfully and often nimbly about how that is the case and how we bring that to bear in a context that's quite different in some ways from that first context. Um, I, I want to change gears and talk a little bit about uh, the reader and and the reader's role in participating in meaning making. And mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, uh, you've talked a little bit about community and the importance of community. So when I teach uh, Bible interpretation, I use the three worlds model, even though it's imperfect, mm -hmm. just to help students conceive of it. So that's the world behind the text, which is the ancient world, the world of composition. Then you have the world of the text, the literary dynamics of the text, the text itself. And then you have the world in front of the text, which involves mm -hmm. the reader and reception history. I feel like when I was in seminary, uh, which wasn't that long ago, but it was some time ago, we didn't really talk about that. We didn't really think about that. The emphasis was, you know, especially on the world behind the text. And only mm -hmm. this is the early 2000s. There was some momentum on the world of the text. There was kind of that literary turn, which we had started right. engaging with in our seminary. Um, but I, I think it felt like the world in front of the text was uh, entering dangerous waters of turning the Bible into whatever I want it to be. And so I, I feel like uh, we didn't we didn't touch that. And, mm -hmm. and any type of reader oriented interpretation um, was seen as um, dangerous, slippery slope, that sort of thing, because um, um, we should just all be able to read the Greek text and, and ascertain the divine and human meaning. 
Um, clean I think slates. It's, you know, we're clean slates, right? <laughs> Uh, now, I, I think part of uh, part of your book in its original form is interested in, in the reader, but I think you've also um, added some things to the second edition to enhance some of those conversations. Can you talk a little bit about what you've added uh, in the second mm -hmm. edition and, and how you engage with the, the issues uh, involved with the world for the text, why they're important? Yeah, absolutely. Um, first, I would say that... Um, uh, yeah, I, I also had a training that said reader response criticism, which was sort of the main way that was framed maybe one generation earlier, um, is dangerous because they're just making it say whatever they want. And it's always, of course, a they, not an us. We never do those things, right? Um, but what I want to note about reader, um, reader perspectives or reader approaches is that they're always working towards some amount of retrieval. And it, you know, it differs across a very different set of, um, uh, across the terrain, there's a lot of different methods that f fall into that category potentially, but there's always in a, a sense of retrieval. What have people missed seeing because we've come from maybe one angle or just a few angles. So I, I wanna affirm that there's not a neat clean divide. Okay, all of these approaches are just trying to get what was there and nothing else. And, uh, and they succeed at that. And these approaches are don't even care about that and are succeeding at that. Um, I just think it's much more complex terrain than that. So I just wanted to say that to start with. Um, and um, what I found is when people highlight the reader, what they're really trying to do is something I try to do in my hermeneutics class, which is help people see what they bring to the reading experience, that they don't come as a clean slate. Um, I have a little, uh, it's a YouTube video that some student, a really talented student of mine has sketched. It's done a sketch of, and then a really talented student of mine has voiced. Um, so Stephen Ebony, thank you. Um, and it's called The People Nature of Interpretation. And it has, it's just like a seven minute video that says, who's in the room with you when you're, when you're interpreting? And I take Romans 14 and 15 and say, well, I mean, you have the reader, you have Paul, you have those weak and the strong in 14, 15, who are they? How do they function? But then the, the reader has all these other influences coming in, including whether you may not know it or not, church tradition or, or uh, his, history of, of interpretation that says which parts of Romans are most important and which ones aren't, and is this that one or not? And, um, and I use, have my students just watch this video and then say, who are the people in my room? And it's a great discussion always because people are like, oh, uh, realizing the whole range of people that could be influencing my thinking, good or bad. And usually it's somewhere in between. It's not always, you know, this is bad. That was good. Um, so this sense of uh, paying attention to the reader means I'm going to pay attention to what I bring. And Trevor Hart has some amazing discussion uh, in his book, I think it's Faith Thinking, that talks about how um, the most dangerous interpreter is the one that thinks they have no tradition, the traditionalist tradition, tradition, you know. <laughs> um, so just becoming aware of that and then um, really thinking about um, how communities, not just individuals, which is the way I'm wired to think as a Westerner, communities read scripture together and actualize it in their own context. That whole recontextualizing project, I do think the biblical text as it's worked out in a new context looks different. And if it's trying to hear those original purposes and have those purposes enacted in a new context, that's good. So there is this really complex thing again that we're, we're up to and it's, it's a communal thing. And so readers matter. It doesn't mat, mat, mean that the reader reigns we kind of push against that idea and we let the reader, you know, we come under the text and sort of submission to the text, but we bring our questions, we bring our concerns, we bring our reactions, and we need to pay attention to all of that in order to really, I think, I, I like to think about bringing a sympathetic hermeneutic to the text. We have a hermeneutic of trust, hermeneutic of suspicion across various perspectives. I find the, a sympathetic hermeneutic helpful. Because um, trust implies that I can't ask any questions. I'm say just the word itself. Where sympathetic means I'm I'm trying to hear Matthew on his own terms in his own context. He's in a patriarchal context. I'm not going to expect him to not be in that. But how do I kind of stay with him when it gets hard and listen sympathetically, um, so that I can hear God's word for me, which is part I have to hear Matthew to 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 hear that. 
Um, that that's really helpful. Um, can you talk more specifically about what you what you modified or added to your book? Oh, in the second thank you. Edition? That was a good question you asked. Thank you. And one of them is um, that I really tried to expand my reading partners in hermeneutics, in exegetical, hermeneutical kinds of topics, uh, to more global voices. Um, I had already begun to do that in other parts of my work, uh, my Matthew um, commentary in the Two Horizons series, we have a chapter, Kyle Roberts and I writ, wrote together on reading Matthew with feminist, feminist critical voices, reading Matthew with global voices. Um, so I, I was becoming more and more aware, kind of in my own writing, trying to bring in voices that, that really help us hear the text um, and contribute some really um, interesting um, perspectives on what this this means um and so in the book i um I, you know one of the things i was very aware of when i wrote in 2005 six and was published you know 2007 the first edition was how the conversation in hermeneutics is really a white male conversation at least it was at that point it, and i was already reaching for voices beyond that but those folks weren't writing hermeneutics textbooks. I realized for me as a woman to write a hermeneutics textbook was a weird thing <laughs> because not many women were doing that. And not many people of color were doing that at that point. Um, and so um, what I realized even in 2019, 20, as I was re doing the revision, there still was, there's still a dearth of voices um, of people talking about hermeneutics, but I could draw on uh, even little bits of what people were saying in different different places about their method. I found Issa McCauley's book, which just came out like a month before I put in my final version. I was like, okay, I need to get a copy of that somehow. And uh, um, luckily my, my copy that I ordered came like a little bit earlier than the release date, yay. Mm -hmm. So I was able to kind of bring in some of that. Um, Dennis, Dennis Edwards has a little book on interpreting the Bible, really helpful. Um, Elizabeth Maburu, Elizabeth Maburu, um, has a book on African hermeneutics that I found really fascinating, especially that the, the three categories of genre that I bring in. So, you know, poetry, um, a narrative and epistle as kind of the three biggies. I don't have a whole section on subdividing a lot of um, genres. I don't have the space in the book to do that. She has those and then she has wisdom literature from her African context that she, she hearing that in the text more places than even necessarily just the wisdom literature, which is a big section actually of the Old Testament. And I, I, I you know, found that really helpful to think with her uh, and learn from her about what is it that uh, makes sense hermeneutically from her perspective. So um, those are just a few of the voices that really helped me to expand my thinking and offer something to a wider context, hopefully with some voices that represent that wider context. Yeah, that, that that that's um that's so insightful because you know we think Africans do African hermeneutics and Asians do Asian hermeneutics, but we just do hermeneutics, right? We 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 think yeah, we do, yeah. but then we reality, okay, wait, yeah. we're part of our I'm own doing American a Western tradition. hermeneutic tradition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. and that's something that we have to reckon with. Uh, you know, part part of the reason I think this is important is because. I feel like in the academic world that we've lived in, you and I, for for decades, mm -hmm. um, you know, I have a I have a colleague who's Native American, uh, Randy Woodley, and he talks mm -hmm. about how we're trained to be contextless, in the sense that we go to these conferences all over the country and we don't know anything about the place we're in, and mm -hmm. we're taught to ignore body, ignore space, ignore feelings ignore experiences mm -hmm. and just talk about quote unquote objective things and um uh and 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 what we're learning now from uh you know a variety of these perspective readings is i think maybe allowing more for that um what you're talking about the experiential dynamics of of personhood mm -hmm. uh to enter into conversations that we have kind of put those things at a distance all in the name of being objective. And now we're realizing yeah. um, maybe that wasn't possible and maybe that wasn't even good for us. Um, so mm -hmm. I appreciate you talking about that in your book. I wanna change gears and talk about your Philippians commentary because mm -hmm. it's one thing to talk theory and you know to talk in, you know, in, in um, uh, rigid ways about um, philosophy of interpretation and methods. Uh, but you're also a seasoned uh, commentary writer and, and, and involved in engagement with the text. 
Um, just to kind of start off uh, with a little bit of background, um, you talk in the book about just having a personal fondness for Philippians. Um, why why mm. this text? Um, you know, mm. I, could, I could imagine you might have a hunger for writing a commentary on another gospel. I know you've done a lot, a lot of work on Matthew, but I could see there being a hunger for another gospel. Why, why Philippians? Well, I was asked to consider um, writing uh, the Ephesians commentary for the Tyndale series, and um, I did decline, but I said, if Philippians comes free, please let me know. Part of it is I've walked through Greek, uh, upper level Greek course in Philippians. So when you do that, you also then um, start to really press into the secondary literature, you know, various commentaries, you get a sense of the issues. I felt I was much more ready to do that. If I was going to start in Paul somewhere, it would be Philippians. Um, but I have this lovely history with Philippians because in my second year of college, I co-led a Bible study, the whole we university chapter that I was a part of in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. We were doing Philippians for all of our Bible studies. And they gave us, when we went to training camp for a week on Philippians, they gave us Ralph Martin's Tyndale commentary on Philippians. So that was my first commentary I ever had. And so then to be asked to write in the Tyndale series and, and for me to be a land in Philippians was just a pleasure and an honor and just a sort of a lovely turn of what God is doing in my life kind of thing. Um, so, so that was very fun. And yeah, I've always loved Philippians is a warm letter, at least the way I perceive it, warm and conciliatory. Um, and yeah, and I then I think, you know, pressed into further the literature out there, your, your work with Michael Bird, but also your little commentary. My students read that while we were all working through my commentary. They're reading it as I wrote it kind of thing last year at this time. Uh, it was just a pleasure to do that. And yeah. I like Philippians. I don't think I'll write a Galatians commentary. I just don't think I will. <laughs> yeah. And not Romans. I'll let Beverly yeah, get into that would, that's, put out that's her. A, that's a beast of a challenge. Work on that. Yeah. Um, in your in your introduction of Philippians, um, you actually have a little section on hermeneutics. I think it's just a couple of pages long, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it's kind of unusual in a tr more traditional mm -hmm. commentary to have that where it's meant to be kind of a um, traditional expositional exegetical commentary. Uh, why did you include that? Why is it important yeah. to kind of s say that, expose that up front? Hey, listen, we need to be thinking about hermeneutics. Yes, because I'm me, I think, you know, because of my interest. But also I was I started to write this commentary and you'd think, you know, I've written actually three commentaries on Matthew. One's in, uh, you know, one volume. So it's tucked in. And but anyway, two kind of significant length commentaries on Matthew. 28 chapters, and I, I felt like um, the narrative approach I took often just helped me decide what to write on, what not to. Every commentary is selective. Even the thickest commentaries are selective. So you have to make decisions along the way, what literary issues I'm gonna raise, what historical issues, what theological themes that an author is pushing into. What am I gonna talk about? Those are gonna be three legged like stool, right? theology or history, literary theology. Um, I was stymied when I started writing on Philippians. I'm like, I defaulted to this because I thought four chapters, you know, I could cover every word in a commentary in some sense, right? You could cover every single word. Well, I don't approach communication word by word by word in a computation method, but I found myself doing these little, like a little BDAG words. To, I'm like, what am I doing? I kind of freaked out in chapter one somewhere. I thought, what am I doing? I've, I've got to have a guiding. My method has to guide me here. And my method is that Paul's communicating across discourses. And certainly words are important to that. But I have to decide to address something or not based on how it's informing the key communicative messages of what Paul's up to. So I just had to stop and kind of get my bearings. And, and I thought, I need to talk about this because I realized that of all the commentaries I'm, I'm reading, I can hear a slightly different hermeneutical method in each, even though everyone's paying attention to literary or linguistic um, history and theological stuff, they're all paying attention to that, but they weight it differently. They do word stuff quite differently. Sometimes I read like, I feel like I'm reading a word study, like I'm reading little bits of BDAG throughout, you know, this like little, little word studies. BDAG plus, um, which is a lexicon, BDAG is lexicon. So um, I, I just felt the need to write it. And I, 
I love, I love letting people know where I start because I think that's just fair to say, this is how I start. This is why you'll never hear the word literal in my commentary. I go quite <laughs> particular on that, both in the second edition of scriptures communication and on the book. And also how I go about reading the Philippian situation. Implied author is important to me. So I don't go to Acts 16 right away. In my mind, I try to, okay, what am I, what can I learn about Paul and his relationship with the church right here in the letter? It's not adequate to stop there, but it's kind of what sits at the center. So let me talk about that a little bit. I loved Marcus Bachmiel's commentary and um, Elsa Tamas's commentaries on Philippians uh, because they do that. They situate themselves just a little bit. Um, I, I, I look for that and long for it. So I thought, well, I'm going to offer that. I will do it. You know, I want to start a trend, but I don't think that's necessary. going to happen. So. But well, I like the idea of us all of kind of time. putting it out there. We have a little bit of time just to um, talk about your um, experience writing this Philippians commentary. You know, I, I think, um, you know, you're probably in the same boat as me where you come in with certain experiences and impressions and assumptions. Mm -hmm. And then as you write it, um, some things stand out to you, things yes. that surprise you, you know, you come with certain expectations. Okay, this is going to go in this direction and then it goes in a different direction. Was there anything that kind of surprised you or stood out to you as you as you wrote this commentary that kind of caught you caught you unaware that you were going to end up reflecting on this or um, highlighting that particular theme that you wouldn't have thought of ahead of time? Hmm. Um, I think the piece that I keep on coming back to is uh, Philippians two five through eleven, which is what's called the Christ hymn sometimes. I refer to it as Christ's poem because then I don't make a statement on whether this pre-existed, whether okay. Paul wrote it or he adapted it, all that stuff, which is, you know, pages and volumes written on. Um, but I was really struck. Um, I think it's more poetic than not. Um, Fee, you know, sets the conversation back in the early 90s by saying it's elevated prose. And I think a lot of people have moved that direction or resonate with that. And that's fair. Um, but I just felt... I, I heard the poetry more pronounced um, than I had before. And, you know, the Bach Mule and Lynn Coick and um, Yermias, go back to Yermias. There, there are a variety of people that, uh, oh, and um, Silva in his commentary as well, kind of draws on, it says this has exegetical significance that it's poetry. So I was really drawn to the poetic nature of it and also then thinking about how we interpret that way. So hermeneutical questions that came out of it. So that was, I, I wasn't planning that. I mean, I think I always was drawn to the, to the, whether it's poem or elevated prose, I was drawn to it because it's just beautiful. Christ, you know, ex exaltation after having been humbled to the lowest point. And we all know the, the passage, I think, but um, that was really surprising to me. And I still resonate uh, with it and kind of I'm reflecting on it for a set of lectures I'm doing in the fall and one of them will be on that passage. Um, so that was a bit of a surprise. Um, it, it, 4, 10 through 20 into the last part, which in a Greek class, you're always like rushing when you get to the end of, you know, it's like, oh, yeah. really quickly because we took too much time on the rest of the letter. Uh, it was kind of that almost an afterthought in the class just because of the way that worked. But, um, you know, the thank you part of Paul's letter, the thankless thanks, uh, for the gifts that they've sent. And I was, I was really intrigued by it. I mean, you know, both interpretively and also just in the sense, theologically, what does it offer us? This is this really this theology of abundance of God will provide. And, but as Elsa Tam is nicely points out, these aren't rich people saying these things. You know, this is Paul in prison waiting for maybe a next meal from visitors who will visit him, whether in Ephesus or Rome or wherever, we'll kind of allow for both since we're both sitting here. Um, and I don't have a hugely strong stake in that fight, but um, but also the Philippians who Paul re you know, refers to elsewhere as not a rich church by any stretch um, out of their poverty they gave. And what does it mean to think about a theology of abundance in that kind of context? A God who is abundantly, an abundant giver. And that was really, Wow, that that kind of it still impacts me as I think about it. How do I, as a Western rich Christian, and not everybody who's in the West is rich. I mean, how do I, as a rich white person, um, grapple with what Paul's doing here? Because it's profound, especially in those contexts. But 
maybe those contexts allow them the Paul and the Philippians to see something I can't see. What is that about? So that's kind of where my theological reflection ends for the whole entire commentary. And I'm still grappling with that. And, and uh, so grateful for voices that helped me hear that better. Great. Well, thank you. We are wrapping up, but I do want to just ask you what else you're working on, what you're excited about uh, writing mm -hmm. and researching these days. I know you're um, you know, it's kind of funny, you work on these projects, and then they might not come out for a year or two, you've kind of yeah. moved on in some ways to another mm -hmm. thing. Um, and so it's kind of this weird feeling people start reading a book, and they say how much they appreciate it, and you've already started working on the next thing. So I know you're probably well underway on some other projects. Tell us what else is going on. Well, I'm just at the cusp of working on uh, the first Peter commentary and the new international commentary on the New Testament. So we're excited about, and I've done publishing in first Peter way back from when I was a younger scholar. Uh, and so I, I have that kind of in my wheelhouse. Um, and then for an editor named Nijay Gupta, I'm doing a themes on first Peter uh, in the Zondervan updated theme yeah, we're biblical themes. Title. Yeah. New we're Thank biblical you themes. Very much. So yeah. those are going to be very much in tandem in the next season, which makes a lot of sense. The stuff I won't be able to fit in the commentary because there's a word count limit. I'll just put in my folder for um for use in that. So I'm looking forward to that because I, I I am really enjoying working in letter in epistles. Um so I feel like uh that's just kind of nice to keep on going and um apply it to first Peter, which I've taught. Uh, taught in a lot. I've taught a lot of courses on that text. That's great. Um, I recently interviewed um, Dennis Edwards on First mm. Peter because he wrote the story of God, and he's really yes. thoughtful about things like the household codes and yes. uh, and issues of identity, and which which um, First Peter is very much engaged in identity formation. So mm -hmm. looking forward to your work on that. Um, just to those who are watching and listening. Definitely check out uh, Dr. Brown's uh, work, past and 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 recent. Um, she has great work across the New Testament, and we look forward to your future work on First Peter. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for having me.